Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. I hope you're all in good health and in good spirits. I'm sorry I haven't posted a video in some months. Truth be told, I had been feeling kind of blue for a while, but I'm back now. As you probably guessed from the title, it was my birthday recently. Well, a few weeks ago, but that's still recent. And of course, I wanted to splurge on my favorite hobby, manga. Reading manga makes me so happy, and it's what I cling to when I'm feeling blue. And so I really wanted to share some of that joy and fun with you all. Today, I'm going to be sharing everything I purchased or received as a gift over the last couple weeks. In the spirit of gifts, I'm also going to be sharing some secret Santa gifts from last year. I'm also going to try and do something a little new. Usually in my hauls, I like to spend a little bit of time going over the plot of a manga first and then diving into my thoughts on it. But to be honest, plot summaries are kind of hard to write, especially when it's so easy to search for blurbs online. So this time around, I want to spend a little less time on introducing the manga and spend more time on whether I enjoyed it. I figured that this would be more meaningful, but let me know if you do want me to summarize the plot in future hauls. I'm more than happy to do so. Without further ado, let's get started. Up first, I have some continuations from last time, starting with volumes 2 and 3 of A Man and His Cat. I didn't think it was possible for me to love this manga any more than I already do, but volume 2 proved me wrong. A man and his cat follows the daily lives and the relationship between a widower and the cat he recently brought home. In volume 1, we got to learn a lot about Fukumaru the cat, like his life in the pet store and how happy he is to finally have a home. But in volume 2, we get to learn even more about Kanda, the widower, particularly about how the loss of his wife is affecting him and how he's been changing after adopting a cat. I absolutely loved seeing Kanda slowly start to heal from all of his pain and the loss he's been dealing with. I bulldozed through volume 2, but I'm trying to pace myself a little bit with volume 3. These books are so thin, and I want to savor each chapter for as long as I can. As cheesy as it sounds, I also had no idea it was possible for me to be this happy. And not just this happy from reading manga, but this happy in general, with anything. Every time I read Amanda and his cat, my cheeks hurt from how much I'm smiling. It also just makes me extra thankful for animals. There's a stray cat that's been hanging around my apartment complex for over a year now, and my family's been taking care of her. Seeing how much happier and healthier my mom has gotten after starting to take care of this cat reminds me a lot of Kanda. I'm not really sure where to go with this, but I just think that I can never be grateful enough for the role that pets play in our lives. If you're in the mood for a pick-me-up that'll leave your heart bursting with the warm and fuzzies, definitely check this out. Next, I have volumes 2 and 3 of BL Metamorphosis. I remember mentioning in my previous haul that I'd make a first impressions video for this manga, and I'm so sorry I never got around to it. I just lost my inspiration for it at the time, but that is absolutely no indicator for how awesome this manga is. BL Metamorphosis centers around two characters an elderly calligraphy teacher, Ichinoi, and a high schooler, Urara, who bond over their love for boys love manga. While boys love manga functions as the catalyst, I think what draws them to each other is the loneliness they both feel. Ichinoi is a widow who is often reminded of her late husband and moments of their relationship, while Urara has been lonely because her best friend is in a relationship now, and she also struggles with expressing herself and geeking out the way she wants to. So in this manga, we get to see two lonely people form a meaningful, warm, and caring friendship. I really like this friendship between someone who's currently lost in all of the messiness that is youth, and someone who finally has a chance to relive youth. It's just so touching. I think this manga is also a testament to how important hobbies can be, in filling up our time, in giving us something to look forward to, and in bringing people together who otherwise might not have ever met. As manga collectors and readers, I think these feelings are ones we can all probably relate to. I know I definitely do. And there are so many moments in BL Metamorphosis where I related so strongly to the characters. Like when Ichinoi wonders if she'll even be alive for the next volume of the series she's reading. She just gets it. Sudatani, the author, just gets it. This is another one of those series that I'm just so grateful to have found. Yale Metamorphosis has been such a comforting read so far, and I'm beyond excited to keep reading. Continuing with our theme of cozy and warm, next I have volumes 4 through 10 of Natsume's Book of Friends. For a long time now, Natsume's Book of Friends has been my favorite anime. 
but recently I wanted to start reading the manga. I know I already gushed about this series once before on my channel, and if you happen to know me, you've probably already been subjected to my passionate ramblings. But what's one more? Natsume's Book of Friends is probably the single most important series in my life. Which sounds a little dramatic, but it is what it is. It's just so warm and sweet and lovely. The main character Natsume starts off the series completely alone. And to see such a good person finally experience the warmth of friendship and family is just so cathartic and moving. This series has been a gift to my life and I'm constantly learning from it. Because Natsume is constantly meeting yokai and learning about them, a strong theme in the manga is the importance of relationships. Between people, between yokai, between people and yokai, and all of these interactions, no matter how big or how small, are meaningful. I've been reading a chapter of the manga a couple times a week, and every single time I leave feeling rejuvenated. Whenever I need a good cry or a chance to flesh out some feelings that I've bottled up, or even a few minutes just to be and to heal, Natsume is my go-to series. I think the atmosphere of the anime is unparalleled, but I actually really like the manga, and in some ways I think I understand Natsume as a character better here. If just one chapter or one episode, I really hope you'll check this series out one day. Surprise, surprise, next I have volume 22 of Noragami. I don't really have anything new to say here. Yes, I still love Noragami. Yes, it is still my favorite manga. Yes, I'm going to continue badgering my friends to read it. Noragami actually recently celebrated its 10th anniversary, which is so heartwarming and so cool to think about. It's been about 6 or 7 years since I became a fan of the series, and when I look back on those years of my life, I can't help but be thankful. I've reread it countless times, and my enjoyment has never gone down. I still laugh at the same jokes, I still get emotional over the same flashbacks. It's also a series that has been in my life during my highest of highs and my lowest of lows, which is special in its own way. I mentioned how I always try to get people to check the series out. Sometimes they end up really liking it, and other times they really don't. It took me a long time to realize this, but what occurred to me recently is that whether someone enjoys my recommendation has nothing to do with my own enjoyment. Someone could come up with all the ways Noragami is boring or terrible or whatever, but it could not and should not change my feelings. Again, I know this is super obvious, but I think it was important for me to realize that my own enjoyment matters most. A series can be garbage, but if someone likes it, they like it. With this current arc, I'm getting the impression that Noragami is nearing its finale because we finally addressed one of the last big questions, and the final boss is more present now than ever. I honestly have no idea what will become of me once the series does end. Even saying it out loud makes me a little bit teary-eyed. I know I started off this ramble saying I had nothing new to say, but somehow I always managed to find a way. Up next, I have volumes 2-4 to four of Our Dreams at Desk. I finally completed this series. Back in around summer 2019, I actually read volume 1 in the Manga Collector's server as part of our book club. But that was also around when I completely disappeared from the community, so I never finished reading it even though I really wanted to. A few months ago, I was browsing through manga hauls and Breeze Views had picked up the series. In their video, they had mentioned how the last couple lines made them cry. And that comment made me really curious, which brings us here. I felt so comforted while reading Our Dreams at Desk. This manga follows various LGBT plus characters from all ages and all walks of life. And while each of these characters have their own circumstances, I think the general tone is that they all want to live happily and enjoy their lives on their own terms. It was so easy to understand and empathize with these characters. They all felt so real to me. The main character, for example, is outed by his classmates and he finds refuge in this community as he navigates his crush. One of the characters is exploring their gender identity. A lesbian couple is trying to figure out whether or not marriage is a realistic possibility for them in the near future. In short, there are so many moving stories happening at the same time. I really liked this one idea in the manga that your life should not necessarily center around being accepted by your loved ones. Life is also about just being who you are and living happily in your own way. This manga was so emotional, at times so painful, at times so heartwarming and moving, and full of important messages. 
And if I may, it felt really magical and effervescent, if that makes any sense. I cannot praise this series enough. I also thought this manga was pretty educational in a way. If you're someone who does not know that much about the LGBT plus community, I think this manga would actually be a really helpful way for you to familiarize yourself with it and get a glimpse of how societal expectations and norms impact the community. I also think that Our Dreams at Dusk is filled with important universal life lessons. What do you do when you say something really hurtful to someone? How to be a really supportive friend? Or how to even recognize when your seemingly good intentions may have a terrible impact? This was such a heartfelt read, and I'm so glad I finally finished it. Moving on to the new additions to my collection, we have Volume 1 of Magus of the Library. This is a recommendation from a friend, and I'm so, so happy that I checked it out. This manga feels like a love letter to books and to bookworms. The main character is an avid reader, or at least he tries to be. Because he's a resident of the slums, and because of his appearance, he's actually discriminated against, and one of the tactics the village uses against him is to ban him from the library. Vegas of the library spends a lot of time talking about the history of texts, including texts before books could even be created. And I love how much care goes into appreciating books. And what I really love is how the manga specifically focuses on libraries because they are public institutions. And they're important because they make books and in turn knowledge accessible to anyone. The manga spends so much time setting up the world and gushing over how amazing books are. And I think that made me even more sad that the protagonist couldn't enjoy them. And I thought it was so fascinating that the manga also uses this in a way to comment on human rights and one's right to dignity and to live well. Even though his name is on the blurb of the volume, I'm intentionally not referencing it because the way his name is revealed is such an empowering moment, and I think if you were to check out this manga, it would be so meaningful to wait for that reveal in the volume itself. I think anyone who loves reading will truly appreciate this manga. There were so many moments that I could relate to that echoed my own love for books. My only issue with this volume is that perhaps the info dump might be too big. At times it felt like I spent more time reading about this world than experiencing the world itself, so I can only hope that the subsequent volumes spend less time on world building. Up next, I read Kingdom of the Gods. The only reason I bought this manga is that I really, really enjoyed the Netflix show Kingdom. The writer of the Netflix series originally pitched the idea for a period zombie series as a manga because she felt that at the time she couldn't bring her idea to life as a live action. But obviously since then, she did figure out how to tell her story in live action. And I figured since both the manga and the Netflix series were written by the same person, they've got to be comparable, right? I could not be more wrong. Kingdom of the Gods is contained in one volume. Only half of this volume is the actual story. The other half is a completely unrelated side story. Frankly, a few chapters is not nearly enough time to flesh out zombies, so it felt like I was reading a snippet of a much longer story, or a snapshot. The manga does introduce the key issues that it needs to, the people of South Korea are hungry and impoverished, there's no faith in the monarchy, and the turmoil within the monarchy itself. But because there isn't time to flesh it out, it's just not that interesting. By the time I finished it, my only thought was, oh, that's it? It wasn't necessarily bad, but I don't think it was worth the money. Especially for the VizSig price tag. The second story is somehow even less interesting because I just didn't care about this random murder of Prison Island. I don't think I can recommend this to you even as a casual read because I really don't think this story is worth the time or the money. If you are interested in what a zombie outbreak would look like in a historical setting and how that would become exacerbated due to famine and political instability and conspiracies, I would recommend checking out the Netflix adaptation. From the stellar acting to the stellar cinematography, it's just way more captivating. The plot is also much more developed, so I think it's a better use of your time. On to the donation pile this goes. Next, I have volume 1 of Become You. I'm a big fan of Takano, so I knew I wanted to check this out. 
like the title implies, Become You is about embracing what you love and becoming the most authentic version of yourself. I find myself drawn to stories that take place in high school because of all that the ideal image of youth signifies, like having boundless energy, unrestrained dreams about the future, diving in headfirst into whatever interests you, and experimenting with yourself. Even though I'm now a boring adult, I still find stories that explore youth and growing up so motivating and inspiring. And in Become You, it was so nice seeing the two main characters inspire each other. On the surface, they both seem too different like an energetic puppy meets an old grumpy cat, but I really liked their dynamic. Takano is just so great at creating compelling characters, and I really appreciated the emphasis on healing and moving past one's pain and trauma. It was very touching and also a little bit somber. And of course, I love this theme of chasing after your dreams. I know I hardly touched on it, but I also really like the role that music plays in this manga. Can anything get better than a manga about music and chasing your dreams? I think not. The main character also spends a lot of time narrating retrospectively, which reminds me a tiny bit of Higashimura's blank canvas, so I'm left wondering if volume 1 was simply a gentle introduction to what will ultimately be a very bittersweet story. Volume 1 was published in, I believe, 2019, but Volume 2 has gotten pushed back a few times. Right now, it's supposed to come out this August, and if it does come out then, I'll happily pick it up. Moving right along, I have volume 1 of Life Lessons with Uramichi Onisan. I found out about this manga while I was looking for new slice of life anime to check out. There's supposed to be an anime adaptation, but I figured it could never hurt to check out the manga first. I like the idea of exploring the world of television, and particularly children's television, which I assume is always meant to be optimistic and encouraging, and it's funny to contrast that world with the extremely pessimistic Uramichi. I don't have that much to say about this manga, I haven't finished this volume, but so far I think it's just okay. I like that the chapters are short and easy to digest, and I think everything is well paced in that we don't linger too long on anything, whether it's the cute kids or the deadpan comments. <laughs> Despite all that, I don't think this manga is my style. It's pretty edgy, and I felt like I got whiplash whenever Uramichi would start off saying something cute and unassuming, and in the next panel drop something super self-deprecating. I've only read a chunk of the volume, and the slapstick comedy already felt repetitive and worn out, and that deterred me from continuing at the moment. I think the humor of the series comes from what I touched on earlier. Uramichi is saying things like his life is meaningless to a bunch of children, and the kids have really funny reactions. He and his co-workers have to don really cheerful personas and costumes, but once the cameras are off, they can wallow in their misery. So it's this world that I find funny more so than the actual dialogue of the manga. I'll probably finish this volume and then decide if I want to continue with the series, but at the moment, I'm leaning towards donating the book instead. Next, I have Dekoboko Sugar Days, which I picked up mostly because the cover and the title looked so cute. I love all things fluffy, adorable, and wholesome, and this manga has some of my favorite tropes like childhood friends, mutual pining, oblivious characters, and opposites attract. The main characters are also so cute, and who doesn't want to read about two nice guys realizing their feelings for each other? With how often one of the main characters kept denying his feelings, I assumed this was going to be a really slow burn. But the couple actually got together relatively quickly, so about half of this manga is focused on the pining, and the rest is on the development of the relationship, which was a pleasant surprise. I also went into this assuming it would be tame and PG, but they actually do have sex in the end. I also appreciated that the main couple properly communicated what they wanted and prepared safely. I know, that's the bare minimum for a healthy relationship, but still very much appreciated. I have very few issues with the manga, and they're mostly with the quality control of the publication itself. At times, the typesetting was so sloppy and it made it harder for me to enjoy the manga, when all I could focus on was a glaring, off-center text bubble here and there. Overall, this was a really delightful read. If you want something fun and silly and sweet, I think you'd enjoy this. Next, I'm going to be sharing some Secret Santa gifts. Twice a year in the Manga Collector's Discord server, there's a Secret Santa, and it's always so much fun. I know it's been a while since December, but gift giving is one of my favorite things, and I couldn't resist sharing the really thoughtful manga I received then. The first thing I received was the Wise Wise Beasts of the Wizarding Wisdoms. I mostly had this on my wish list because I like the author, I like short and indulgent stories, and I really like boys love. This is a BL anthology that takes place in a wizarding school, but the unique feature here is that the characters are anthropomorphic, or animals with human characteristics. 
Yeah, I was very curious to say the least about how this could work. I think Nagabe is really skilled at making short story collections. Similar to Love on the Other Side, I thought Wise Wise Beasts had a pretty good selection of stories that I think covered a lot of the spectrum of boys' love. There was a fluffy romance between two longtime friends, an oblivious couple who still don't know how to label their feelings, a one-sided obsession, and even a hint at a student-teacher relationship. There's also a variety in temperaments and the depths of their affections, so it felt like it was curated in a way to appeal to as many readers as possible. Each story is followed by descriptions of the animals that inspire the characters, and I thought it was really cool to learn about the real-life habits of these animals and how Nagabe used those characteristics to create fictional characters. Overall, I'm happy I read this, and I would also recommend it if you're curious. There are some stories that I probably won't ever read again, but there are also some that I'm looking forward to revisiting when I'm in the mood. My next Secret Santa gift is Therapy Game Volume 1. This is a manga I've heard a lot of great things about, so I wanted to check it out. The premise of the series isn't anything new. One of the main characters wants revenge on the other character by making them fall in love and then dumping them to humiliate them. But of course, while in the middle of it, they actually fall in love, start to feel guilty, and then don't know how to come clean. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like I've seen iterations of the story many times before. But that's not to say I'm tired of these tropes or that they're game is boring or cliched at all. In fact, I loved this volume. Even though I could predict what was going to happen, I was so entertained throughout. I think both characters are really charming and easy to root for, and their relationship is super sweet despite the rocky beginning. I also found their backstories and character development quite compelling. Like I said, Therapy Game isn't reinventing the wheel, but I don't think a story needs to be different and revolutionary in order for it to be great. I'm definitely looking forward to volume 2, which wraps up the main story. And I would recommend this to anyone who's in the mood for a short and straightforward BL. Up next, I have Jackass. I don't have too much to say about this one, but it was surprisingly very sweet and wholesome for what I assumed was going to be a much kinkier story about pantyhose. The premise is that one of the main characters has a fetish for nice legs, and he asks his friend to wear pantyhose for him. I could see something like this getting really old really quickly because how many different ways can you ask your bro to show you his legs? But Jackass was really funny and it didn't overstay its welcome. There are a couple storylines involving multiple characters, but the manga overall felt well balanced. I also liked all of the characters. I'm also so weak for blushing faces, and Jackass has plenty of pretty faces to admire. And generally speaking, the art was really good. I don't often see manga about fetishes, so that was also pretty neat. But overall, I thought this manga was good slash alright. Off the top of my head, I don't really have anything to critique, so it was objective objectively fine, but I just don't see myself rereading Jackass because it didn't leave a lasting impression on me. For the last of my Secret Santa gifts, I have Noche, which is a collection of D. Grayman illustrations. I have this on my wish list mostly because I've kind of been interested in building an art book collection, and I thought this was a pretty nice one to start with. D. Grayman is from a completely different era of my life. I remember reading and watching it with my friends in high school and truly enjoying it, but I actually don't remember that much of the plot off the top of my head right now. Hoshino's art, however, has stuck with me over the years, and it is still some of the best I've ever seen. I especially like her character designs, and it's been a lot of fun looking through this book. My friend who bought this for me also likes D. Grayman, and it's nice knowing that other people have a soft spot in their hearts for this series. And now that I'm talking about it, I'm wondering what the story is up to these days, so maybe I'll check it out again in the future. Up next, I have Volume 1 of Real, which I've wanted to read for a really long time. When I was younger, I was a big fan of the Slam Dunk anime, but when people think of Slam Dunk, when people think of Inoue, they're of course thinking about his art. So I figured it was about time that I actually read one of his manga. I don't know what I can say that hasn't already been said, but this first volume had so many good things going on. Real centers around wheelchair basketball, and I love how basketball is what brings three totally different people people together. I absolutely love how distinct each of the main characters are. They're at different stages of their lives, they have different grasps on their emotions, they all cope differently, and so they each bring something so different to the table. The characters are what's so compelling about this manga. I like stories where the characters don't quite fit into their surroundings, I like seeing characters cope with displacement and the harshness of reality. This first volume already introduced a lot of complicated feelings like guilt, regret, loss, and inferiority, and it's so nice seeing how basketball is the tool that lets these characters rebuild their lives. To be honest, when I finished volume 1, while I did enjoy it, I actually didn't feel that hooked. 
Not in a way that made me want to put the rest of the series in my shopping cart right away. But now that I've had some time to simmer in my thoughts and really reflect on the manga, I can safely say that I want to continue it. I'm particularly interested in the third main character because he's the only one so far that we got to see prior to his disability and trauma, so I'm curious about how Inoue will show us how he's going to adjust to his new life. All in all, I'm glad I finally started real. I know I'm super late to the party, but hey, I made it. Up next, I have volumes 1 and 2 of Mermaid Saga. I actually have not read this yet. I originally picked it up because a couple weeks ago, I read this kind of terrible webtoon about mermaids, and it just left me so unsatisfied. So I needed a new mermaid story to rid me of my memories of that webtoon. A friend of mine is actually hosting a Mermaid Saga book club in the manga collector server, so I figured I would wait to read this with her. And if you like book clubs, especially manga book clubs, you should definitely check out the Discord server. And Mermaid Saga itself sounds really interesting, so I'm looking forward to reading it. Next, I picked up volumes 1 through 4 of Twittering Birds Never Fly. When volume 4 was announced many a month ago, my Twitter timeline went nuts. All of the Fujin I knew were so excited about this manga that I personally had not heard of at the time. But if all of these people, from all walks of manga life, whose opinions I greatly respected, were all excited about Volume 4 finally coming out, I figured this had to be worth checking out. So I pre-ordered Volume 4, and then I picked up the first three volumes as they were reprinted. And then I read all four volumes in a manga server book club. This series, from the get-go, was one of the most captivating BL stories I've ever ever read. Just to backtrack a little bit, I consider myself pretty well read in boys love webtoons, but not nearly as knowledgeable about boys love manga. Maybe that matters, maybe that doesn't. Regardless, this was unlike any BL I have ever read before. Normally, I gravitate towards lighthearted and fluffy stories, but lately I've really been into angst. I think Twittering Birds has the right amount of twistedness and darkness to keep me hooked and wanting to read more. Both main characters actually have quite sad and traumatic backstories, and I'm positive that some readers will find their experiences triggering. So if you want to read this manga, I highly, highly recommend spending some time researching it. I think there's a Does the Dog Die entry about it, and I'm more than happy to talk about it with anyone. The two main characters are just so interesting. Off the top of my head, I can't name any other BL manga that spends so much time fleshing out the characters and their dynamic. I have never seen someone so devoted to someone else like the way Domeki is to Yasuo. I felt like I was third wheeling whenever they were together. I didn't know this before starting the series, but the setting is actually organized crime or Yakuza, and I have expected it to be just a gimmick and in the background, but Yonada spends a lot of time building this world. So as a reader, I don't just feel invested in the characters themselves, but the stakes in the world also feel really high. I've also never read a BL that spends so much time on developing side characters. Usually it's just the main couple, the side couple, and maybe a friend, but Twitter Birds has a decently sized cast of interesting characters, and they're all important. I'm also quite fascinated by the role sex itself plays in the series. There's a lot of trauma surrounding it, absolutely, but throughout the series we see various characters use sex as a tool for power, control, and entertainment, but there are also characters for whom sexual intimacy is an act of reverence and love. Yonada's writing is just so incredible and unlike what I'm used to in this genre. I haven't felt this invested in a manga in a really long time, and Twittering Birds is one that I can see myself rereading several times. I constantly found myself teetering between agony and fondness, and I gotta give kudos to a series that can pull so many reactions out of me. Volume 4 ends on an insane cliffhanger, and because of the years between volumes 3 and 4, I first thought I'd have to suffer for years until volume 5. But surprisingly, volumes 5 and 6 are slated to be released this year, which is amazing news. Next, I have volumes 1 through 4 of Antique Bakery. This is a series that I had been on the hunt for for a long time, mostly because I'm weak for Yoshinaga and desserts, and one absolutely cannot go wrong with a cafe setting for a boys love manga. Antique Bakery is a super funny workplace comedy, and it has a phenomenal cast of characters. I just love how quirky everyone is. I mean, where else would we get to see a playboy, an ex-boxer, and a baker with demonic charm working together? I also really love the conversations between the characters. One of my favorite moments was when the owner of the 
Bakery came up with an entire captivating backstory for two women customers, complete with assumptions about their personalities, their sexuality, their affections for each other. All of his colleagues ate it up and praised his astuteness, only for the guy to be completely wrong on all accounts. So far, I've only read about one and a half volumes, and I like the sort of character of the day approach the first volume had, with each chapter focusing on a different customer and how they found the bakery. I also love stories about food, which is something Yoshinaga excels at. The descriptions of the desserts felt excessive at times, but I ended up enjoying those passages much more than I thought I would. I think my only point of confusion is that there really isn't any romance so far, so it definitely feels more like a slice of life than what I imagine a BL manga should be like. It's not a problem at all since I absolutely love Slice of Life, but if you're going into the manga expecting a lot of romance or even explicit scenes, please temper your expectations. I've been told that there's a tone shift near the end of the manga, which sounds interesting, but since I waited so long to read this, I want to savor the journey for as long as possible. And if that means putting out the ending for a while, that's fine by me. Up next, I have The Ice Wanderer, which is a collection of short stories. Taniguchi is a pretty well-known author, so I wanted to try out his work, and I figured a short story collection would be a safe way to sample his style. Unsurprisingly, I was blown away. In general, all the stories are related to nature, and in particular, the way people interact with nature and the wilderness. Immediately, I was drawn to the art. It's so detailed in a way that feels vivid and real. When I looked at some of these snowy mountains, for example, I felt like I was transported to Yukon, which is a little scary, but also really thrilling, or rather enthralling, because I was truly fascinated by the world Taniguchi wanted to show us. In each story, I felt the desperation, the loneliness, and the obsession. I don't think I've ever read any other stories that deal with interacting with nature, especially in such a thought-provoking and introspective way, and I think even for that alone, everyone should definitely read this. Finally, the manga I am the most excited to talk about today, Kazehikaru. I picked up volumes 1 through 16, which is so wild for me because I am not one to buy so many volumes of a series in one go. This is easily one of the best manga I've read in a really long time. The story follows a girl named Sei who wants revenge for the murder of her father and brother. Straightforward, right? To get her revenge, Sei joins what will soon become the Shinsengumi. And if you're unfamiliar with them, they were a special police force during the Edo period, tasked with things like maintaining peace and order in society. Of course, as emotional and important as revenge can be, it can't motivate you forever. So while spending time as a samurai, Sei begins to understand the importance of their job, the strength of their camaraderie, the sense of duty, etc. And this truly moves her. Rather than becoming a samurai as a means of getting revenge, she truly sees it as a way of life and as a means of protecting the people she loves, which is so fascinating. Sei is also in a unique position where she understands what life is like for women in this era, but she also has the freedom to go beyond that and live as a samurai. It's like a doubling of her life, if you will. It's also through her friendship with the leading man, Okita, that she realizes that she wants to do more than just wait on the sidelines and hope for the best. She wants to be out there protecting him, which I found so moving. This doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of how much I love this manga and how captivated I am by it. Even before I finished the first volume, I already felt something stirring in my heart. By the time I got to the third volume, it had already soared its way through my favorites. It just really stuck with me, and even now while I'm rambling about it with my whole heart, I don't even fully understand why this series made such a strong impact on me. Regardless of that, I can immediately see how much care and thought went into Kazehikaru. It's extremely well researched and everything about it feels believable and realistic. The action and fight scenes are all intense and the stakes feel real. The entire cast of characters are each so unique and memorable. And despite its setting, this is still very much a shoujo manga. Say, while a samurai is also still a young girl trying to navigate things like growing up and naming the feelings she has towards her first crush. I also think it's a really funny series, such as with the banter between the characters, or Say stubbornly thinking that boys are all gross. No series is perfect, and for my impatient self, my main issue with Kazehikaru is actually its release schedule and print run. At this point, we're running at about one volume per year. I believe volume 28 is the most recently released volume, 
and the series wraps up at volume 45. So we have a long wait ahead of us. At this rate, I could very well be in my 40s by the time it's finished, but I'm perhaps foolishly hoping that maybe they'll be released a bit faster. In a previous video on my channel, I mentioned wanting to study Japanese again, and this manga is the reason why. I simply cannot wait however many years it'll take Viz to finish printing the series, so I figured my best bet is to study Japanese again and hopefully finish reading it in a few years. Yes, I am that desperate. The funny thing is, I don't even mind. This might sound dramatic, bear with me, but I enjoyed the first few volumes so much that I actually feel thankful to be alive so that I can continue reading the series. Again, it's been a really long time that something grabbed my attention so strongly. Related to the slow release schedule, some of the earliest volumes are also now out of print. Most of them aren't that expensive to find, but that does make it a barrier to entry if you're not willing to buy used volumes. I'm biased, but I think the series is worth getting into despite this, especially if you're already interested in historical fiction, samurai stories, and a slow burn. That finally brings us to the end of this haul, and I think my lungs are seriously about to give out. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you also made it to the end, you are truly a gem. Thank you also to everyone who wished me a happy birthday last month. I hope you all can go read something you love today. I, however, am gonna go drink some water and then take a nap. See you next time.